It is really a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for coming. I know you had many choices, but I want to point out this Sabbath school is probably the only one in the world. I have made a survey of it where we consistently talk about scientific topics and try to reconcile them with our faith and integrate them. And <coughs> It strengthens, I think, all of our belief in God and our witness. Now, I don't know how this presentation is going to work, but I can make one promise. Most of the material will be out of this world. <coughs> um, this just came over, found it this little cartoon, it doesn't have much to do with what we say, but still it's kind of an astronomical cartoon, so I thought I'd share it with you. <coughs> so I'd like to spend the first... Oh, um, the off? Yes, let's turn the lights off. <coughs> I'd like to um, introduce this topic <coughs> by saying that judged by the <coughs> amount of material written in Adventist literature, we have not really thought much about the solar system as such. Uh, in the index of Mrs. White's writing, there's a single entry under solar system, and she writes, <coughs> the light of the sun reflected by the moon and the, quote, stars of the solar system. That's the extent of Mrs. White's reference to the solar system by the stars, she's meaning the planets, <coughs> I guess. Uh, in the Adventist Periodical Index, which covers at least a hundred years of Adventist publications, the titles, there are nine entries under solar system and most of it are, most of it is <coughs> material for master guides, information about the solar system. <coughs> so this is a baffling situation because the solar system is a mysterious entity. There's a lot of mysteries there. And of course we focus on Earth, six literal days of creation, <coughs> but then we we don't go much beyond our cosmic neighborhood. We don't talk about the solar system. So I, I, this is why I thought it may be an opportunity to talk about the solar system and see if the Adventist understanding of the great controversy between Christ and Satan may shed light on the state of our cosmic subdivision the solar system. And before I continue, I want to make a few remarks <coughs> that occurred to me that, that I, I don't have a slides for. <coughs> if I'm correct, I don't know of any Adventist university that has a department of astronomy. <coughs> I could be wrong, but I just don't know of any. <coughs> now, one of our favorite texts in the Bible is the heavens declare the glory of God. <clears throat> and many of us have had the privilege of going camping out of the city, out of the bright lights of the city, and look at the night sky, the dark, velvety sky when we're camping. And when we look up, we're just transfixed by the, the sheer spectacular view. It almost seems like that the stars are hanging down. You could almost reach them. The sky is covered with, with, with lights. I mean, it, it's just, just totally. A person, regardless of his or her religious affiliation, will become religious for at least a moment when you look at that spectacle. So there is so much there, yet 
Adventist universities don't have an astronomy department. We have not invested in training astronomers. <coughs> astronomy being a physical science, a bona fide physical science that distinguishes astronomy from cosmology. Cosmology, on the other hand, is an interpretation of astronomical findings and both astronomers and then professional cosmologists utter many pronouncements about the origin, the present state, and the future of the universe. And, okay, well, I'll make some uncharitable comments about cosmologists a little bit later. <coughs> Not being very nice. So, even though <coughs> Adventist universities, so far as I know, do not do astronomy. There may be some clubs, astro astronomy clubs on universities. I'm not aware of any. I don't know of any, for instance, here in Loma Linda or La Sierra. <coughs> but some physics professors have affiliation with astronomers and they actually do work in astronomy. And one notable example happens to be Tiffany summer scale at Andrews University. You may have heard that last week, um, <coughs> last week the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to discoverers of the gravitational waves. And Tiffany summer scale and her students have been collaborating with the group that won the Nobel Prize over the years. And here is a release by Andrews, part of the uh, release uh, for, from Andrews University on this topic. And, and, and so this is really recent stuff. Andrews University is excited to announce and congratulate our colleague Tiffany Summerscales, Professor of Physics, for her part in the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO. <coughs> Scientific collaboration recognized today with a Nobel Prize in Physics for its discoveries of the gravitational waves. Three of that project leaders, Rainier Weiss of MIT, Kip Thorne and Barry Barish, both of Caltech, are specific named recipients of today's Nobel Prize. In announcing the award, <coughs> the Royal Swedish Academy called it a discovery that shook the world. Summer Scales, along with her students, represented Andrews University as one of 103 academic institutions in 18 countries that make up the LIGO scientific collaboration that worked with Weiss, Thorne, and Barish on this project. That research led to, co led to confirmation of Albert Einstein's 1916 theory that gravitational waves travel across our universe at the speed of light stretching space in one direction and shrinking it in the direction that is at right angles. Okay, so I, this is such a magnificent development <coughs> and I'm so proud of Andrews University and different summer scales that this, her work was a continuation of her graduate work. She must have, she worked along these lines in her graduate studies. So she continued it with the help of students. And to be connected, <laughs> it's a feather in the cap of Adventist institutions, Andrews University, and the physics department at Andrews. Dr. Mattingly is the chairman there. All right, so now this was just a short introduction my general complaint about lack of astronomy in the Adventist intellectual world, <coughs> lack of articles. But so here is our Milky Way, and uh, the sun's position here, sun's location, this is our solar system over here. You notice the scale is 10,000 light years, is this much, distance from here to here is 100,000 light years and the distance if you wish to travel across the solar system with the speed of light it's nine hours. So on a scale if this was a, a model 50 kilometers across the solar system would be three millimeters. 
to scale. Okay. So there are a lot of other <laughs> heavenly bodies around us. Yet, as I pointed out earlier at another presentation, our solar system is isolated from the rest of the stars in that there are four light years to the nearest um, star from us. Mm. So here is just another question that I like to ask you before I go into those of us who take the Genesis account, Genesis 1-1 account, literally, seriously, when was the solar system created? The focus of the narrative, of course, is the Earth. And so, no specific mention of the planets in Genesis 1. There are two places in the account when you can kind of squeeze it in between the words. Choice one, on the first day of creation, in the beginning God created the heavens, which is the sky and the earth. Okay? <coughs> and that is, I won't give away what my choice is. Choice two, fourth day, then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Parenthesis here, there's no parenthesis in the Bible, but this is a parenthesis parenthetical remark, he made the stars also, implying that the stars were not made on the fourth day, okay? But how about the planets? All right. Now, I, I'm not one to ask for opinions, and the opinion polls really, as Paul pointed out, <laughs> will not determine the truth. But if we go with, uh, with the idea of choice two, which I think people would be likely to go at first the planets because we're talking about the sun and the moon. You say, well, maybe the four days when the planets were made. Then we have a situation when on the first day the Lord made the earth and there is the earth spinning because it's day and night, totally isolated from anything else, just spinning around. Okay, and then on the fourth day, the Lord creates the sun, the, the orbits, the gravitational uh, <coughs> interaction between the sun and the earth and so on. So that, that's, that would be the implication if you go with choice two. The choice one is my favorite, but I have to keep it quiet because it doesn't sound <coughs> orthodox enough. So I, I just share it between you and I. That I, my thought is that the Lord created the entire solar system, sun being there but not ignited, unignited sun. And all the gravity, the orbits worked out this, gravitational interactions. Then on the fourth day, he ignites the sun, the Lord. And then the stars, the moon becomes visible and so on. <coughs> now those of you who may feel uncomfortable with this notion because it doesn't say it in the text and we are very um, more comfortable using literal verbal in well literal meaning of every word in Genesis 1 I call your attention to the creation of the moon Genesis 1 calls the moon the lesser light okay but you and I know that the moon is not, does not have a source of light. It's a mirror. Okay? So if the Bible can take liberties like this, calling a mirror the light, I can take liberties, at least in my privacy, not forcing other people to believe, to believe that on the first day the Lord created the solar system in the dark without the activated sun. But this will be one thing that we'll have a nice discussion afterwards, if you wish. <coughs> okay, I'll continue now. <coughs> so I want you to see the planets here, the eight planets that we have, and these are spectacular, spectacular drawings or illustrations. I just love to look at this. Jupiter, Saturn, uh, my trusty pointer worked, it's not working, the Uranus and Neptune, 
And then here is our Earth. You can recognize the Earth and the twin of Earth, the Venus. This little thing here is Mars and then Mercury. Now I will show you the same four planets in relation proportional to the Sun. <coughs> All right? That is really something. You know, we're still here, but we're becoming less and less important here. <laughs> you almost need a magnifying glass. What happened here? Oops. Sorry. Did I push the wrong button here? Yeah, I pushed the wrong button. Forgive me. So <coughs> that's our solar system, the, at least the inner planets. For, and in action, this is a very, very nice, nice representation of the sun, the four inner planets. And then we have here, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, the asteroid belt. A tremendous collection of rocks, particles, various sizes, just floating around. Then come the four outer planets, which are much larger. These are the gaseous planets. And then we have a, another belt of material. These are made mostly of icy, volatile material. And the pronunciation of this belt is after the name of the discoverer that I have never heard pronounced. I want to say Kuiper belt, but maybe somebody knows how to pronounce it correctly. It's K-U-I-P-E-R. You can say Kuiper. I, I, I tend to say Kuiper, but Kuiper, it's a Dutch name. Um, they, forgive me for this illiteracy in that, because I don't mingle with astronomers. I don't, don't think I even have a friend who's an astronomer. I, but so that's what it is. And then, if you go further out, there are all kinds of other objects here. It's called the past the Neptune. Past the Neptune particles, Pluto being just one. Uh, of these, and I made a, a slide here, collected a slide. These various bodies with their names, most of the names are from mythology, Greek and, and Asian mythology. Here is the Earth by reference. But these trans-Neptunian objects extend way out, way out in space. The, we measure the space, the distance is usually by astronomical units. The distance between the Earth and the Sun is one AU. And then this is a logarithmic scale, so the past the Neptune, the trans-Neptune objects go out to 1000 AU and beyond. Mm. Um, this is a picture of Bouchard Garden, and that is my closest, <coughs> closest approximation of the Garden of Eden, except for this rail. Uh, please forgive me for that. <laughs> but this, this is, you know, and then I have this from, this is why describing what the earth looked like when the Lord created it. As the earth came forth from the hands of its maker, it was exceedingly beautiful. Its surface was diversified with mountains, hills, and plains, interspersed with noble rivers and uh, lovely um, lakes. Thank you. But, um, hmm. but the hills and the mountains were, thank you, not abrupt and rugged, abounding in um, terrific. terrific steeps, frightful chasms, as they now do. The sharp, rug rugged edges of Earth's rocky framework were buried beneath the fruitful soil, which everywhere produced a luxurious growth of verdure. That's our Earth. And I just go back to this, and when I read it, I, 
I just rejoice and I wish I was there. But then I look at Bouchard Garden and so that's, you know, close enough for me. And then there is this. Mm. The entrance of sin blemished the Edenic beauty of earth. We accept that. But this is outer space. This is the surface of Mars. So it's devoid of sin. What is this now? Okay, here is now we're becoming you're a creationist, you're looking at the pictures out of space, and so we're wondering what, what is going on here. So the conundrum of the solar system is why is only Earth habitable <coughs> and looking halfway decent even now? What about all the other planets, at least the inner planets? Okay. Now, a materialist person doesn't see anything wrong with Earth being the only, so only habitable, habit, inhabited planet. They would say, well, the conditions for life are <laughs> only available here, so this is where life evolved. <clears throat> Forgetting that there was an experiment made that cost the one billion dollars to get the answer to because it was discovered that Mars has conditions that would permit microorganisms to exist, anaerobic microorganisms. So we sent two spacecrafts in 1976 to the surface of Mars. These were the Voyager missions. These were sophisticated chemical laboratories that landed on the surface of Mars looking for life. And our friend, Mr. Schiller, at an earlier session referred to some of the results from there. And he, he was under the impression that there was evidence for existence of life on the surface. Well, the answer is no. Uh, mass spectrometry down to the resolution of one billion parts per, uh, one billion parts per, uh, one part per billion, excuse me. They found that there was no organic matter on the surface of Mars at that time. <coughs> um, and so it was concluded after spending one billion dollars, this is the answer to the one billion dollar question, which is, is there life on Mars? The answer is capital N, capital O, no. But, <coughs> This is now a parenthetical remark. NASA could not take such an answer laying down, so as a result, you do not read about the Voyager missions. Instead, they lobbied for further missions to the Mars to search for life, digging deeper and serving. And so we have spent, the US taxpayers payers have spent untold amount of money sending more uh, robots to the Mars, and I'm not complaining. I mean, it's, it's still better than building some other things. But, <coughs> and they have discovered the chlorobenzene, traces of chlorobenzene on the Mars. Now you can guess what chlorobenzene is. It's, it's some substance associated with, with instruments. I, I'm almost certain, although that this is, this is a, a result of, of human, human activity. Uh, chlorobenzene is not a, any, anything that, that, that you, you would, would, would associate with uh, life or anything like that. So anything, anyway, the, the status is still there is no life on Mars, but NASA is going to undoubtedly send more, um, more uh, probes to Mars, and they are thinking of sending humans to Mars too. Uh, just to make sure. Now, once humans arrive, there will be life on Mars. <laughs> That's the only way that there is going to be life on Mars. My okay. <clears throat> so why is the Earth? This is a conundrum. Why is the Earth the only habitable planet? And for creationists, another conundrum. Why did the Creator leave such a mess in a solar system? Because it is very, very messy. It total contrast with the pristine condition of the Earth 
and what we, how the way we imagine the Lord operates. So, <coughs> and, and part of the messiness is the um, incredible number of moons. This is a small sample of the moons in the solar system. Here is Earth. Earth has one moon, but Jupiter has maybe 69 moons. Small objects, you know, these are the largest ones, and, and so on. If you look at the, um, the p terrestrial planets, the four inner planets, you will notice a diversity, at least in, the at in their atmosphere. Mercury hardly has any atmosphere being close to the sun, about one ten thousandth of the pressure of, of Earth. But it contains oxygen, very interestingly. Uh, Venus is mostly carbon dioxide with a good dose of sulfuric acid. So when the Russians, Russians probed the Mars, sent a probe on the surface of Venus, excuse me, uh, it survived maybe a few minutes only. Just a tremendous heat and sulfuric acid that does a number on a space probe. Earth is, of course, about 80% nitrogen. And Mars is mostly carbon dioxide. In contrast, the outer planet's atmosphere is mostly helium and hydrogen and helium, quite uniformly. Uh, pictures that we have from Mercury uh, shows pot marks and craters. And so we, we turn, of course, we want to know what do people think where the solar system came from, and we turn to the most reliable source known to man, Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> and it has excellent articles, I have to admit. And so these three illustrious gentlemen, Swedenberg, Kant, and Laplace, are credited for coming up with the thought that our solar system came out of a tremendous, gigantic cloud of dust and gas to gravitational collapse. Um, it, it has been modified. It is noteworthy that the first person thought about this was Emanuel Swedenberg, who claimed that he got the idea during a se seance. <coughs> but uh, this seems to be a, a theory that came and went, or went and came. It was popular, then fell out of favor, and now it's back. And so on Wikipedia and elsewhere, and in textbooks, you will read something along the line that our solar system began forming with a concentration of interstellar dust and hydrogen gas called a molecular cloud. And the cloud contracted under its own gravity, and our proto-sun formed a hot, dense center. And the remainder of the cloud formed a swirling disk called a solar nebula. This first mm. activity, the formation of the proto-sun and the sun, is estimated to be take about a million years. And then the formation of the um, planets out of the, and I have, have several slides listing or describing this event. Um, uh, the, the formation of the planets are thought to be between 10 and 50 million years. So first the star forms, and then the leftover from the cloud become planets. That seems to be kind of the general thought of how s stars and planets come into existence. Um, and the, the notion is that these clouds begin to rotate, and so this would help explain why all the planets are more or less in a plane. They may not be necessarily lined up exactly in the same angle, but... Uh, okay, so here is Lev Landau and his comment that <laughs> uh, <laughs> cosmologists are often wrong, but they are never in doubt. Okay, so that you smile, okay. Yeah, I just like it. Lev Landa was a Nobel Prize winning 
physicist in Soviet Union. But uh, I'm not a cosmologist, not an astronomer, so it's a little uncharitable uh, thing to say about cosmologists. What are, what are the poor people going to do to make a living? I mean, they have to come up with something. Imagine y if it was your job to explain how everything came about. It's mind-boggling. So I, you, you, you listen to them, and they do certainly, when they make a pronouncement, it is usually with a lot of self-confidence. I, I have to say that, at least when I read about their confidence. So <coughs> just a, a few odd comments about this. Um, if the gases that were there, supposedly they were hot, they would, you would expect that they expand instead of contract. Um, the mass required to oppose such an expansion is called the genes ma mass, J-E-A-N. French mathematician calculated that you would have to have a huge mass to, to force a collapse. It's something like 100 to 300,000 times the mass of the sun that would be necessary for the gravitational collapse to occur. Now, if the, if the spinning solar nebula was cold instead of hot, then if it collapses, then the angular momentum that, that was obtained should have been transferred to the sun, which has 99.8 mass of the solar system, as you saw the picture. But it is actually the planets that have most of the angular momentum of the solar system, and that is a puzzle. Uh, and perhaps there are solutions to that uh, in the world of astronomy. I, I'm not familiar with that. Now, the other thing that is quite obvious to an amateur like myself is that if the solar system is originating from a homogeneous spinning cloud and gas and dust, you would expect that every planet would be somewhat uniform uh, and rotate in the same direction. Venus happens to be rotating in a retrograde, re opposite direction, not very fast. OK, I'm sure there is an explanation for that also. But the compositions and general properties of the planets are very, very different. So the inner and outer planets are unique, especially the inner planets. Uh, <coughs> and so I just summarize here that the dimensions of the solar nebula would have to cover several light years, the formation would have to take 50 to 100, 100 million years. And if this is the case, then everything that we have in our experience can be traced back to this vast collection of gas and dust. This is where you have come from. This would be the explanation. It's, I, these are my comments. I find this an absurd, logic-defying hypothesis. It would take our collective breaths away were it not that it's been repeated so many times that we're just numb. We, we expect that this is going to be given as an explanation of where we come from, this huge gas and dust. <coughs> now we turn to the creation story. And we find that the Lord, when he creates, he Instead of bringing everything into existence perfectly, he works in a stepwise fashion. And so it took six days for our planet and its biosphere to complete. Notice I don't put in this solar system because I don't know for sure. Just work. But the Bible says in six days the Creator finished the project Earth. And I can see that that's impossible to read. So this is a quotation from Genesis 2.2. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. Genesis 2.2. Now, the solar system to a creationist appears unfinished. I defy anybody as a creationist to say that it's done. It, it seems unfinished. <coughs> 
But then there is this verse in Isaiah. I have here the New Living Translation. He made the world to be lived in, not to be a place of empty chaos. The King James Version says God made the earth to be inhabited. That God di did not make the world in vain. He made it to be inhabited. So the question that we have to ask, did the Lord make all the other planets in vain? Okay. <coughs> but this is only for the creation, it's to have a problem. The unsettled aspects of our solar system, they write, I think we can expect the perfection in every one of the handiwork of the great creator. And I expect this perfection existing everywhere else in a created universe. So because things are so imperfect here, I, I would suggest that almost everything we find in the solar system is unique. The only place in the entire universe is, is what we see here. This is unique, uh, the mass. I hope so. So when <coughs> astronomers, well, when cosmologists talk about, and th this, this reveals my utter ignorance, but, and skepticism and, and ill humor. Um, when uh, cosmologists talk about galaxies colliding, stars exploding, uh, mayhem out of space in, in, the, in the cosmic world. I, I can't believe it. I do not believe it. These bursts of energy, the supernova and so on. There must be some other explanation and we have no idea what's going on. This reminds me of, uh, forgive me for a personal story, my mother, I brought my mother out when I became a citizen here to the United States and then we invited her sister to come and visit. So there in our living room sits my mother and her sister. They speak no English and they're watching a movie, black and white, you know, large. They're having a wonderful time and they, when I come home, they tell me the story that they are watching. It had zero to do with what was actually going on, but they were having a wonderful time. They didn't speak the language, but they made up their own story, and that's all that it took. So when I read about the cosmologists talking about the meaning of these explosions, I think of my mother and my aunt. <laughs> Terrible. <clears throat> now, a, a, a point that I think is significant. Creation of the earth was done in the sight of a thrilled audience of created beings who shouted with joyous excitement in seeing God in creative action. Um, a keen awareness of the creatorship of the Lord is the foundation of our sense of well-being and happiness. This is why one reason why Adam and Eve were admonished to observe weekly the memorial of creation. So the Garden of Eden was intended to be a model to be copied by the children of unfallen Adam. And this is a quotation from education that I think is significant. The Garden of Eden was a representation of what God desired the whole earth to become. And it was his purpose that as the human family increased in numbers, they should establish other homes and schools like the one he had given. Thus in course of time, the whole earth might be occupied with homes and schools where the words and the works of God should be studied and where the students should thus be fitted more and more fully to reflect throughout endless ages the light of the knowledge of his glory. Okay? So, now comes the speculation. And uh, eventually humanity would have occupied all available space on earth. And then, this is a different color because it's my speculation, the Lord could have converted the inner planets of the solar system as well as some of the moons of the gas giants to places fully habitable by humans. This work would have occurred in full view of humanity so that we too could have witnessed the Lord's creative prowess. Okay. And so the explanation of why the <coughs> planets look the way it is, this kind of reasoning leads us to see the 
rebellion of Adam and Eve interrupted God's plan. The earth was not covered with gardens of Eden, little mini gardens of Eden. And so all the, the other things are, are not needed here. Uh, the conversion of the, the other planets for habitable places. Um, the sun, I, I want to point to composition of the sun, which is primarily hydrogen and helium. This hydrogen, 91% hydrogen, 8.9% 8 .9 helium. And the composition of Jupiter and Saturn, we don't know the exact amounts, but <coughs> it is primarily hydrogen and helium as well. Hydrogen being some liquid, some metallic. Uh, in contrast, the Uranus and Neptune are more mostly rock and metals, water, methane, and ammonia. So the hydrogen helium content of planets Jupiter and Saturn suggests that they may be small, unignited suns. Ignited, they could furnish light and heat to perhaps six of the largest moons circulating, circling the other planets of our solar system. <coughs> the barren appearance of the inner planets, the lack of ignition of the, of the planets Jupiter and Saturn may be understood by creationists as the result of mankind's rebellion and the interruption of God's original plan. Okay. Here's the, the sun as it appears today, if you take a picture of the sun. And I, I was driving this weekend and the sun happened to be just blinding me. And I was again reinforced the thought that this, this, is, a, this is not the original plan. Exposure to the blinding light of the sun could not have been the original design on the earth. Okay, it would be a design fault. So because we know that there was a layer of water, canopy of water in its surface, the, the thought is that the light was diffused, just like here, these lenses diffuse the, the light of the, of the of the, the bulb, whatever, fluorescent bulbs. But the, the end result is that there are no shadows in the, in the room. And so the thought is, I'm, I'm pretty certain of that, <coughs> that in the antediluvian world, there were no shadows. Um, in the pre-flood pre -flood world, the water canopy dispersed the sun's light evenly across the sky. At sunrise, the sky may have been pinkish, then turned brighter blue as the day wore on. Then in the afternoon, the brightness began to wane more or less in symmetrical manner until pinkish sunset. From outer space, our planet would have been wrapped in a beautiful rainbow as the sun's light rays would have been refracted by the water canopy. Now, if there were several suns in the sky, the Jupiter and uh, Saturn would be illuminated or activated, they would have merely increased the amount of daytime brightness. <coughs> okay, so then, then the next question here or comment is an even bigger one, and this is the presence of asteroids, comets, dwarf planets, small satellites or moons, impact craters. What are they doing out there? Where do they come from? They should trouble the creationist. The materialist doesn't worry about it. That comes with the territory. Are these leftover materials from the original creation of the solar system? Did the Lord miscalculate the amount of material he was needed and he was just kind of threw it out there? We, of course not. We, we have, we have a, a Lord, a creator who, after cre feeding 5,000 and there were leftover loaves, um, material he commanded to be picked up and used. And in biology, here's where I <laughs> go to my comfort zone, every 
electron, every atom is accounted for in a cell. There are no junk material. There is no junk material. There's no garbage. This, well, there, there are organelles that dispose of garbage, but everything is accounted for. The Lord just does not miscalculate and waste resources. I, I think we can, we can be comfortable with that thought. All right, so then what, what option do we have? Well, the Bible refers to a war in heaven, an open conflict between the forces of God and Lucifer. The asteroids and close relatives, the comets, the dwarf planets, the small moons, the impact craters do not bear the creator's signature. Their existence fits Jesus' description, an enemy hath done this enemy being Lucifer. But when did this all happen? The Bible does not refer to any cosmic events that could have generated the undesirable components of the solar system. Lucifer and his angels were expelled from heaven before the creation of the earth and the solar system. And we know this because Satan appeared in the Garden of Eden. So here, here is now the jump and, and of course the speculation. One possible, and that is what I'm uh, burdening you with, and you, of course you can take it or leave it and, and educate me and give me a better explanation. One possibility is that the undesirable modifications of the solar system occurred after the flood. During the cataclysmic worldwide flood, Satan was forced to remain on Earth and he feared for his survival, and I want to read this to you. As the violence of the storm increased, trees, buildings, rocks, and earth were hurtled in every direction. The terror of man and beast was beyond description. Above the roar of the tempest was heard the wailing of a people that had despised the authority of God. Now here's the sentence that interests me. Satan himself, who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements, feared for his own existence. He was pushed to the limit. He had delighted to control so powerful a race and desired them to live to practice their abominations and continue their rebellion against the ruler of heaven. He now uttered imprecations against God, charging him with injustice and cruelty. <coughs> so, my thought is that in retaliation for his ordeal, the forces of darkness were permitted to destroy an entire planet in the solar system. The current asteroid belt would be the remnant of this planet, that is the, uh, the orbit between the Mars and Jupiter its orbit approximating that of a former planet. The bulk of the planetary fragments would have been sucked into the sun by gravitation, but not before pockmarking every inner planet and the moon with craters. Fragments flying away from the sun may also account from the dwarf planets, small moons, and even comets. Now we have a tremendous collection of small bodies out there, plus Neptune. So and the orbits of some of these comets go way out. I mean, light years, maybe, or light year and back. So it's, it's maybe a reach. But that's the best I could come up with. And I, could see, I can see in these craters and, and this mayhem the evidence of the great controversy. Mm. And a few years ago, two scientists presented a computer model that suggested at one time there was a planet number five between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter in addition to the asteroid belt. And they postulated that the orbit of planet five was unstable and the planet eventually was destroyed when it strayed into the sun. Um, so it is possible that initially the Lord had five inner planets instead of four. And this is just the abstract that says the same thing. Um, looking forward, um, we know that the Lord is going to um, 
create a new earth. Question is, what is he going to do with all these rocks and, um, and uh, irregular bodies and so on? And uh, this is up for discussion. I have my thought and, and uh, we, we can we talk about this, but I, I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much. So let me turn the light on. Okay, yes please. No, no, uh, why? The microphone is ready. <laughs> All right. Um, while you're thinking about uh, destroying everything I said, uh, here, here is the thing. After the new earth is created, it's going to be the center of the universe because the Lord's presence is going to be here. And you can anticipate that the created beings from everywhere in the universe will want to come and, and pilgrimage, do pilgrimage here. And so we will need places for them to, the visitors from outer space, to, um, to stay. And the earth may not be enough to, to encompass. So the Lord may make a few uh, planets there in the vicinity for the visitors to have, have a good time. And, and, and I can see a whole series of, of planets for, for visitors to, to kind of be available and ready to, to present themselves before the Lord. Now that's just, of course, a thought. So that I'm predicting, if I'm correct, that there will be some planets besides the Earth in a new configuration and these planets will serve some function. Okay. Please, please. Uh. I read an article this week in Discovery Magazine and it talked about the collision of galaxies. Yes. In graphic language, how a galaxy, a large galaxy passing a smaller one, sheared off mass and added it to its own. Destroying. And in the end, the larger the galaxy will eat up all the other galaxies. Yes, yes. Now, Evolution, the survival of the fittest in a galaxy world. So does that make what's going on today, I mean, is it going on today, or is all of this from some time in the past? Looks to me like it has to be going on today. My, my thought is this is cosmologists at their best, you know, projecting what their experience is here on Earth into the, into the world of outside the cosmos. I, what can I say? I, I just sh this is the kind of thing that I shake my head and say, I cannot believe it. But it's of, you, you do what you want to do with it. But would you, would you un accept the creator having the lack of foresight or, or on purpose creating galaxies that, that would dis annihilate each other? It just doesn't s square up with, with our, our concept of a creator. Yes, please. I, I really appreciate what you've presented because I have also had the same problem with that. I just can't, I, I think they're seeing something, but what it is, I, I'm reserving judgment and not just taking what they say because of, like you say, God is a God of order and why would he create all this chaos and what is the purpose of, you know, they say the new stars are being created and all that. What is the purpose I, of I, it in, from, you know, a biblical point of view? So I, I appreciate all that you've shared. We don't dispute the observation. We, we accept right. what they, but we question their observation or their conclusions. <clears throat> but since they are talking about from a materialistic, most of the materialistic worldview, what choice do they have? I, I almost un I understand why they say that. You, you first have to have a, a creationist worldview before you, you, 
you go somewhere else, please. I was interested in some of your comments about what happened at the, during the time of the flood. Yes. One of the things we don't know, the Bible says there was war in heaven. We have no idea what that possibly means. No. And the destruction of heaven, does that just mean right here on this earth? Does it mean the entire universe? But Ellen White says in the very last uh, paragraph of the Great Controversy, that it's all over. Sin and sinners are no more. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. Oh, isn't that a beautiful e finish? Everywhere in the universe, yes. everything will be fixed. Yes. Whatever is wrong now. Yes. But, yes, of course. And, and so this is why I say that <clears throat> my thought is that Satan and his angels were confined to this place here, the earth and its environment maybe. And so the universe is, is probably pretty, pretty pristine even now. But apparently he wasn't confined to this earth until right, later. Right. So when there was war in heaven, that yes. was before. Yes, and, and of course we don't have the wherewithal. Uh, nobody pr presumably died in that war of heaven. It was more like a pushing and shoving match and forcing them to to vacate certain areas and, and restrict their activities. I, I don't think anybody was killed. I, I don't know. Uh, but apparently Satan had the opportunity to meet with God and the angels according to Job. The sons of God yes. got together and, and yes. Satan, Satan was there. Satan was there, yes. For a time being, he was permitted to, to roam around. But and, and he apparently visited other inhabited worlds, trying to persuade them to follow him, and he was rebuffed everywhere. So. So I, I, my thought is that we perhaps don't emphasize enough that the great controversy theme really gives us a, a grasp as why Earth is the only habitable place. And why everything else looks, looks the way it does, which is not very attractive. Yes, please. Um, this is just a tiny bit off of that. Please. For a very long time, I've thought about uh, the fact that in heaven, um, Lucifer and the angels ate from the tree of life, I would think. And um, I, I just, it just has occurred to me several times that his actual lifespan, Ellen White gives a description of him, and he's not the being that he was created to be. It's, you know, you can see the bone, you know, the, the structure is still there, but it's very different. And, and. Uh, he's getting a little older. Yeah, and, and but where he's, he does not have access to the tree of life anymore. Well. It, it, of course, I have no idea how angels continue to live, but I, it was not my understanding that angels had to take fruit from the tree of life. They have a different means of, of continuing their existence, and it is the Lord that sustains them, as it's really the Lord who sustains everything in the universe. So the Lord really is keeping Satan Lucifer alive, the way I see it, and yes, Mrs. White talks about looking a little unattractive, but when Lucifer presents himself here, he'll have a makeover and, and he'll look pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> bad ideas cannot be destroyed by destroying people who host them. Okay. Good ideas, on the other hand, can help us all see better. Yes. I enjoy your presentation. Thank oh, you Oh, you're very so much. kind, Danilo, you're so kind. And what, what I'm hoping, if, if you go along with what I'm saying, you can make it better and work on it and, and improve on it. I mean, but I, I so appreciate your time and attention. It was a, a true, 
pleasure to, to talk about this because you can't just force somebody and sit them down and, and give them a lecture. Nobody's going to stand for that. But you voluntarily gave me a, your ear and I'm grateful to you for that. Dr. Paul. I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one of them is, have you seen anybody who actually calculated what happens to a, a mass of dust and gas? I, I did not. I, I'm so sure somebody would I, be able to do. How do you, what do you, what do you, yeah. yeah. I, and I am curious as to why the sun has so little, as they call it, metal in it. Yes. When, uh, I, I, if it came from the same solar, the from same the nebula cloud. that made the Earth. It, yeah, uh, the you, composition the, of sun should I mean, be somewhat exactly. Yeah, I, the Earth I is like ninety-nine plus percent silicon. what they define as metals. Yeah, silicon. Yeah. No, Paul, you're you're right on. Now on the sun. I, I published an article in, in a review some years ago, and there was a letter that tore me apart, and they published it, too. <laughs> there is another thought of how the sun works, not by nuclear fusion, but it's called the electric sun hypothesis. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It, it, you, you go online and, and look up electric sun. It posits, and there are some evidences that it's, it's like a plasma, heated plasma that, that glows. There is, they, they, they say, and the letter that, that um, was accusing me of accepting the nuclear fusion hypothesis unquestionably, just like people accept the theory of evolution. They tied me right in. The nuclear fusion of the sun and the theory of evolution, I was guilty in the eye of that. Uh, letter writer, but mm, the electric sun hypothesis has, I think, came down a little bit, and and it's a complex, complex idea. But I I know so little about it that it's fascinating. The other interesting set of questions is, um, if we have things correct, and if the Earth was hit by a number of things during geologic time, and if at the same time geologic time was compressed into more or less a year, uh, it implies that the Earth got hit multiple times during that year. Yes. Uh, one could see uh, any number of beings fearful for their lives, but beyond that, um, it implies that there was a time when the solar system was much less stable than it is today because we certainly don't get yearly bombardments no, of, no. Uh, from meteorites yes. uh, right yes. now. Yes. And, um, and yet the, you know, there's one in Yucatan, there's one in Quebec, there's one in Chesapeake Bay. There are a number of different ones that can be timed to, if we have the, uh, chronology correct, the flood year. Um, and it's an interesting question to ask what happened during that year that made things so messy. Mm. Um, we, we discussed a little bit previously about the, uh, the asteroid belt and whether it was the remains of a star that either never formed, or a, a planet that never formed, yes. or a planet that perhaps uh, blew apart. Yes, this would be the and and as I told you, the, so there are some computer simulations that postulate that the total mass right now the total mass of the asteroid belt is about two percent of that of the moon, but the computer simulation posits that initially there was enough material about the same as the Earth, the, the mass of the Earth. So we're talking about a tremendous amount of matter, possibly. But, but certainly, uh, would, why would the Lord create an asteroid belt? Come on. I, uh, fortunately, when you travel in space, the asteroid belt is not as dense as you cannot get through. The space probes have not had any trouble colliding with anything in the asteroid belt as they were going outer, to the outer solar system. 
And the final question is, I know it's early in this kind of trying to put things together, but are we at the point where we can make any kind of predictions that can be tested to look for specific sizes of asteroids or that their composition should be specific? Well, yeah, I, I would think that a prediction would be that the asteroids, the composition of asteroids should somehow be related if they all came from the same source, the same planet. And uh, that's why I'm a little bit, as, as I showed these trans-Neptune objects, they're at least the pictures, they're, they're different colors and so on. They showed a variety of, of, of sh colors. I hope it's not the reality of showing great diversity. I would predict that if if this kind of a reasoning is valid, that the composition of all those fragments should have some relation to each other. And <coughs> I'm a little bit puzzled by the, the craters that we find in the moon. If the moon always shows the same face toward the Earth, I would expect that the Earth was protecting the moon and my <laughs> from the impacts. But uh, I, you know, there are very good question, Paul. Wish everybody a very pleasant Sabbath. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>